This is Joe Wong. Welcome to the Trap Set. During the age of social distancing, we're recording remotely and releasing extra episodes. Today's guest is Ryan Katner, also known as Honus Honus, keyboardist, vocalist, and creative leader of the band Man Man. Dream Hunting in the Valley of the In-Between, the band's ambitious new double album, was released by Sub Pop earlier this month. Ryan spoke to me from his home in Los Angeles. Did you grow up in Philadelphia? Uh, I went to art school there and started my band. I started Man Man there. Where did you grow up? My, uh, my father was in the Air Force, so we moved every three years. Where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> How was it? Uh, it was, you know, it was quite an experience, especially... Uh, uh, not growing up in Montgomery, Alabama. I mean, when, when I was a senior, they still had the Confederate flag flying on the state capitol. Wow. It's pretty wild. And, you know, and they, they try to bring back chain gangs, too, for one. I think either my junior or my senior year. So you'd be driving down the highway, and you'd see, you would see a chain gang working on the side of the highway. Yeah, I think they ruled it uh, inhumane, so they stopped doing it. When you, when you see people chained up together on the side of the road. Like it's so brother where art thou. <laughs> cool hand Luke. Yeah, cool hand Luke. 50 eggs, man. Was it hard to maintain friendships if you were moving around every few years? Yeah, it was brutal. I mean, I didn't maintain friendships for the most part. But it it did teach you how to um, to constantly readjust and make the best of a situation. And in many ways, I joke with my father, it prepared me for a life of touring. Right. Although I feel like I've, I have friends from 20 years ago that I met through touring. Mm-hmm. And yeah, most of my friends now that I've known for that long, it was through touring. But when you're a kid, and this was pre-internet, it's harder to stay in touch with people. Right. And we bounced around the world, so it's... You know, we went, um, I was born in Texas and we went Texas, Philippines, South Carolina, Illinois, Alabama, Missouri. Were your parents musical people? Uh, not really. I mean, my dad, he would play a lot of rock around the house, classic rock. And he played classic rock and classical music. My mother loved show tunes. Um, and I mean, there was always like an acoustic guitar around the house. I remember once I came home from college and uh, my parents already moved somewhere else. So I was in a, a bedroom that I had no experience living in, but it was my new bedroom. And there was an acoustic guitar in it. And my mom walks over the acoustic guitar. She sits on the bed and she proceeds to play Love Hurts by Nazareth and sing it. <laughs> and at this point, I'm 20, 21. And I had never knew she could play guitar. And so when she was done singing Love Hurts, uh, you know, she puts guitar in the bed. I was like, I never knew you played guitar. She was like, there's a lot of things about me you don't know. And she walked out of the room. It's like, whoa. That's kind of amazing. It was really amazing. Well, did you find out what some of those other things you didn't know are? Uh, so some things, yeah. I mean. Like, had uh, she ha- killed a man in cold blood <laughs> at some point? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. She's She's a genuine badass. I mean, uh, I'm half Filipino, so I, f- I feel like maybe I got some of the musicalness from, from that side. Is your mom Filipino? My mom's Filipino. She and my father met in Texas. She was a, she was a nurse in Texas, and my father was a, a young lieutenant in the Air Force. Interesting. My mom is a nurse, and I'm half Asian too, but my mom is <laughs> the white one, and my dad was Chinese. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hoppa, Hoppa Power. Hoppa Power. It's funny, growing up, didn't know any Hoppas, but uh, when, once I started playing music, met a ton of them. Were you connected to the Filipino side of your family as you were growing up? Uh, not really. You know, my, my grandmother, my Lola, she would come and live with us every so often. She would come for like six months to a year. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, not really. Did you feel connected to that part of yourself? Like, did did you feel like you were being pulled to default to one particular ethnic identity? I think a lot of people, uh, even now, when they find out I'm half Filipino, they're surprised. Just because um, m- m- growing up, people just thought I was like a like a a swarthy white kid. But until you saw me with my dad, because my dad is six foot two, blonde hair, blue eyes. And for and people that can't see you, how tall are you? I'm uh, two foot five. <laughs> and your what color pounds. is your skin? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, purple skin purple skin and uh yeah no but i mean uh i I, and i don't really look like either one of my parents but people just kind of naturally assumed like i was like an italian kid or maybe like spanish but uh no i'm a hapa and it it was interesting to grow up you know just it was something i never really considered but looking back on it i just didn't know too many kids that were of mixed race. I didn't either. And there weren't really many representations of Asian people in general in American media. Um, what representations I can remember were kind of weird caricatures like long duck dong, long duck dong or the guy from revenge of the nerds, like the sex obsessed weirdo and, uh, data from Goonies. Data from Goonies was cool. He was cool. But I feel like he probably wouldn't have spoken with an accent yeah, you know, know. in the real world. Um, and like, in fact, like Mr. Miyagi didn't have an accent. Pat Morita didn't have, that was I like know, an I affectation. Um, but it's interesting because now I, I actually work on um, music for some shows that represent Asian people in a different way. And it's made me realize what a vacuum there was. You Um, you work on ugly delicious, right? I did. Yeah. I worked on ugly delicious and his other show, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And I worked on, um, master of none and, um, Nora from Queens, the new Aquafina show. Oh yeah. Nora's awesome. Um, but in any case, it, it made me realize what a vacuum there was when I was a kid. And the reason I asked you that question about, ethnic identity earlier is because I feel like I defaulted to mainstream or white as far as like what, how I perceived myself as a kid. Um, just not necessarily like wanting to be perceived white, but just not wanting to be seen as an other. I, I feel maybe that happened to a certain extent, you know, it, I mean, I felt bad for my mom cause she really had to weather the storm. And the thing about my mom too, is that, she she kind of when in the Philippines she was lucky and her father was a banker so she went to you know like British all girls schools and stuff so she had a, she had like a British accent but you know we would be it, whenever we s- lived in the South that was like half my childhood she 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 encountered a lot of racism well to the point where we were in Alabama she stopped working in Alabama and went back to work in St Louis why what happened I just think you know it's uh, I, I never really understand like women not being paid equally, but then on top of that being like an, like an Asian down there. I don't know. It's, uh, where did she work? She, she's, uh, she's an anesthetist. So she just worked in hospitals. Did she go to medical school in the Philippines? Yeah. Yeah. She got her, well, she got her, her regular nursing degree in the Philippines and then got her, uh, anesthesia Oh, anesthetist degree got here it. at Wash U. So she's a nurse anesthetist. Yeah, yeah. One of my uncles does that. It, yeah, I mean it's 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 uh, it's, it's kind of like I feel like that's its top tier as you can get, but it's uh it's 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 a heavy job. I mean you're dealing with life and death every day. 
Did you ever steal drugs from her? Oh, no. Just, uh, <laughs> just booze out of the liquor cabinet. <laughs> um, were you interested in music from a young age? <sighs> Interestingly enough, not really. You know, uh, I, I, I remember when we lived in the Philippines, my grandfather had a piano at the top of the stairs on the second floor of, this, of their house, one of their houses. And I used to run up and down the stairs and bang my head on the piano. And that was kind of the extent of it. And um, when I was in, I think, sixth or seventh grade, I asked my parents for a, a cool Casio keyboard. And I really just wanted it for all the sound effects, not in, not for anything musical. I just wanted something that I, you know, to make a machine gun noise or a crystal cavern. <laughs> and so they made me take um, piano lessons for about seven or eight months. And then when they realized that I had scammed them just for this keyboard, they, I stopped taking lessons. I didn't start playing music really until out of college. Well, you went to art school. I went to art school. Which yeah. is a great vehicle into the world of becoming a musician, <laughs> I've found, yeah, from totally. talking to lots of people. Maybe a better entry into the life of a musician than going to music school. I mean, I, mean, I remember in high school, I, you, know, I picked up, you know, I picked up one of those acoustic guitars around, that was laying around. And I started on bass. I like I saved my money. I bought some like crappy PV metal bass, like this black PV bass and a little PV amp for like four hundred bucks. Because I was like, oh, bass, four strings, easier than six. Not, <laughs> and I got like my book of Chili Peppers tab. Uh, and it, that's that kind of really ambitious well. as a bassist to just start out. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it didn't stick. So then I just started messing around. With uh, with the guitars, the like, acoustic guitar that was in the house, you know, and and like and I was kind of a half ass guitar player. Could um, you play "Love Hurts"? I could not, but I'm sure if I sat down, I just didn't have the patience. Your poor mom had to listen to you fumbling around, <laughs> all the while knowing that she had that in the back pocket. Yeah, I just you know it, it was like one of those acoustic guitars too, where it, like it really hurts your fingers and the calluses. You know, it takes forever to build calluses, and when you can, you could. You could push a nail through your finger and not feel anything. It sucked. But, you know, I walked away from that experience just being able to play chords, basically. What kind of music were you listening to? Just in my opinion, when like second through fourth grade, I feel that that's when maybe you start to succumb to what other kids are listening to. But I was living in, uh, in Germany at the time, so I wasn't really hip to what was popular in American culture. Let me guess. All the kids were listening to Can. That had been incredible. <laughs> I don't know what they're listening to. Uh, you know, my first CD was the soundtrack to La Bamba. Oh, man, we had that. That would have been 87. Yeah. My dad bought a CD player in 87, and he got three CDs for free with the CD player. And they were La Bamba, the soundtrack to The Big Chill, and the Tiffany album. Oh, Nice. But I remember yeah. seeing La Bamba in the theater and being extremely emotionally affected by it when he dies. Yeah, same, same. I, and I think in a lot of ways it influenced, it, it definitely influenced in the kind of music that I like. And uh, That soundtrack was mostly Los Lobos, I believe. Yeah, Los Lobos. And then there was one song with um, Brian Setzer. Um, right, yeah, because it, he played Jerry Lee Lewis in the movie, I think, right? I, th I can't remember who he played. Or maybe... <sighs> he did Summertime Blues. I remember that was the song he played. Okay. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So I got that CD. And then, at this time, I was an only child. And so, I after school, I would just have to go to, like, the, the rec center and, like, play foosball. And and I, I remember there I saw Disorderlies on, a t on, like, a VHS tape. So then I bought the cassette tape for, Dis for Disorderlies, the Fat Boys. And then I got into Weird Al. So those are my first three. Oh, it was uh, La Bama soundtrack, Fat Boys, and Weird Al. Hey, that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, I just looked it up, and uh, Brian Setzer played Eddie Cochran in La Bamba. Eddie, Eddie Cochran, yeah. Which would make more sense than him playing Jerry Lee Lewis. But, um, and, and, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, I think Lou Diamond Phillips is Filipino, so... Maybe, you know, maybe that really, that really sunk in with me. 
seen like a Filipino. I never musician. realized that. I thought he was Mexican <laughs> because of La Baba. No. He's like I think I think he's he's either full Filipino or a Hapa as well. Well, so that kind of uh, reinforces what you said earlier about everybody thinking you were Mexican or something when you were a kid or Hispanic. Yeah, I mean it doesn't help now that I have like a mustache and <laughs> you know. But anyway. Um yeah, and then and then I went off to art school. Wait, and so thought, wait, you didn't go to art school right after getting the Disorderly CD. I mean, did you start, did music start to become more central in your life uh, as you got older? And did you start cultivating your own taste kind of distinct from not only your families, but from peer pressure? Well, when I was, when I was in high school in Alabama, uh, well, you know, in junior high, I was in Illinois. And so I was listening to stuff like, like Paperboy. It was just, it was just like really bad rap singles, you know. Baby's got back. I, th- I think I bought. I think I got the Beastie Boys record. I remember my grandma; she bought me uh, Pablo Honey. Uh, the first CD my dad bought me was Blood Sugar Sex Magic. He didn't he didn't bother listening to it first, <laughs> uh, and didn't realize uh, some of the lyrical content on there. Uh, but then when we moved to Alabama, everyone I went to high school with was into like Dave Matthews and Widespread Panic, and I just wasn't into that stuff. Mm. And so, and 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 I, I didn't have the benefit of uh, like a cool older brother to turn me on to music. So I just kind of had to make my own discoveries. Like I discovered the Meters, uh, just reading like a Rolling Stone article, and um, I got into Flaming Lips. And actually, I feel like in high school, and maybe in early high school, most of the cool music I discovered, or quote, cool, I discovered off Beavis and Butthead. Right. Like, I discovered the meters, the butthole surfers. Wait, uh, the meters weren't on... Were the the meters meters. on Beavis (laughs) and Butthead? (laughs) No, I meant the Flaming Lips. I discovered Flaming Lips, BJ Harvey. Right. uh, I think Ween... Oh, I didn't really listen to Ween in high school. But uh, Butthole Surfers. Yeah. People don't realize what a force that show was. I mean, I guess maybe some people do, but as far as um, turning people onto new music, I have some friends that were in bands whose videos were on Beavis and Butthead, and and they mentioned that like the day after those episodes aired, they would sell tens of thousands more records. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it really. I, I would not have discovered the Flaming Lips and PJ Harvey. And and if if it wasn't for them making fun of them, but um, I got I was really into Blind Melon when I was in high school. Uh, I'm trying to re- I I think I even remember what they said about the Flaming Lips. It was when the song "She Don't Use Jelly" was a big hit. Yeah, and I think they were like, "Oh, this is college rock or something." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the PJ Harvey one was like forty foot weenie. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was, I think it's the, for the song "40 Foot Queenie." Ah, my forty foot weenie. <laughs> oh man, I, I don't miss the times when everybody talked like Beavis and Butthead. Oh, it was the worst. It was but like, I do, um, I, yeah, it happened when I was in middle school too, and it, it was like between the summer of seventh grade and eighth grade, you come back to school, and everybody's, all the boys were talking like Beavis and Butthead. I had a frog baseball shirt. Yeah, it's like the probably the same time that people were wearing like Big Johnson shirts and stuff. <laughs> but I, I remember I really liked Chris Cross. Not Christopher Cross, but you know, jump jump around Chris Cross, like wearing your pants backwards. I don't know if I ever wore my pants backwards to school, but I definitely Did you shave your overalls. eyebrows? No, I didn't shave my eyebrows. Um, I don't think I don't think I ever got into Vanilla Ice, but I remember having debates about who was a better dancer, him or MC Hammer. And which side were you on? Uh, I think the MC Hammer side, but I remember going to like junior high dances, having no clue how to dance because I because I went from like Germany to then the Midwest, small town Midwest, and it was absolutely brutal. <laughs> When but you were in having, Germany, you weren't yeah. old enough to go to discos or anything like that, were you? No, I was like second through fourth grade. I know, so they, but I, they start earlier there. Like, I feel like European kids <laughs> start oh, yeah, drinking I mean, and going to discos by the time they're like 13 or something. Yeah, there were definitely kids that I, because we lived, we, we never lived on a base, fortunately. We always lived like in the community. 
and there were definitely kids. Was your dad an officer? Yeah, he was a, he, he retired a colonel, but uh, he was a flyer, so he was gone all the time. He was a navigator. Um, there were definitely kids my age smoking cigarettes, you know, like second and third grade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you smoke that young? No, no. Maybe when like, did you have like, a when did you have a cigarette for the first time? Uh, I think it might have been after college. I, mean, I might have smoked in college a little bit, but I don't think I did. I think it was like after college. Like, and and I've never I've never been like a a heavy smoker or anything. Like I'll smoke after a gig or something. Someone gives me a cigarette, but not so much anymore. Yeah, I had a friend when I was in sixth grade who could buy packs of Marlboro Reds, and he was growing marijuana in his backyard. In sixth grade? Yeah, he, he was advanced. <laughs> he I also mean, I, could I, I, build all that. He, he was really good at building things. Like yeah. He built a potato gun, but you know he was also good at building models, and his dad was building an airplane in their basement, like a tiny airplane. What happened to this guy? The last I heard, he became a welder in... That's cool. Um... Seattle. Yeah, I have a I have a friend who was a he was in Man Man for a long time. I won't I won't blow a spot up, but I know that he had smoked weed since he was like eight or nine years old. And I, he told me the first time he did acid, his one of his older brothers like played him disco volante, and it was just one hell of a trip. It wasn't good. Oh man! <laughs> they they gave their little brother acid and then played him that album. So were you interested in visual arts from a young age? I was, you know, uh, I, I was really into, I was really into storytelling from a young age because, you know, I, I, there's eight years difference between my brother and I. So especially when we were overseas in these small towns, there weren't like other American kids around. So I had to just entertain myself and my parents are really strict about TV. So I'd only get to watch a couple hours of TV on the weekends only and so it forced me to be creative and to just kind of like make up stories and amuse myself. And so um, I was always record, like doing radio shows on, on cassette tapes or just making little short films on a, v- on a camcorder. And actually, one of the, I found one of those cassette tapes and I put a sample of it on our new Man Man record of me being eight years old singing. Did you write stories too? I did. I did. I, did. I wrote. Show, I wrote show stories. I was. It was one of those things where, at the time, I didn't realize like, why are you making me go to this this different class from? But in, in hindsight, they they would put me in like like the creative classes, you know, like whatever the magnet equivalent was. But it felt compulsory and not too fun at the time. Uh, I just was. I was. I wasn't. I think it was. I. Uh, I just got really bored in class. I probably had ADD. But but they saw that I had a gift for or an interest in you know creative writing and being creative and and sometimes that manifested in acting out and being a class clown and so I think they were just trying to channel me into something productive and not bomb making. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever make a bomb? I never made a bomb. <laughs> Did you have violent yeah, we, tendencies we, or something? Uh, no no no. Let me clarify. They just I never didn't made want you to be like an antisocial you know misanthrope. <laughs> yeah. And I, and it was, it was, and you know, and it was definitely concerns with my, my parents are like, cause you know, there'd be parent teacher conferences and they would be like, Oh, we're worried about Ryan. Cause he tends to gravitate towards like the kids who get in trouble a lot. And we know he's a good kid, but we don't. And for me, I was like, those kids always seem more fun. Right. They are. And, uh, and I, you know, and, and yeah, it's just, it was more fun to me than, than I guess towing the line. What was the impetus to go to art school? Uh, I wasn't well informed. <laughs> uh, you did, know, did you I, have I, ambitions I, of being a serious artist? No, well, see, I actually my, when I when I was in, I went to private Catholic school in Alabama, and then my senior year, uh, I, I split the day between going to that high school and then going to like one of these magnet programs. And I, and I went to, so, so I would drive across town and go to this public magnet program for communications. And it was just so I could scam their equipment and make a short film that I could submit to colleges. 
because I wanted to go to school for for, uh, for filmmaking and screenwriting. And that's what you were studying when you went to school? Yeah, I, I went to school for screenwriting and playwriting. Where did you go to school? I went to University of the Arts. You said you went there because you were misinformed. Why do you say that? I went there because, uh, you know, I was I was in Alabama. I made the short film. It won this, like, film fest in Colorado somewhere. Uh, and I, I, you know, I applied to one school. I applied to Tisch. I applied to their writing program and to their film program. And then I got a phone call that I had to pick one or other. They won't tell me if I had gotten into one or the other. And I chose film and then I didn't get in. So then I had to scramble for schools. So, and it was after, you know, most places were still taking admission. So I think in August, after I graduated, that's when I was like, oh, I can go to Philly where I've never lived uh, and go to this art school, which I've never heard of. Or I could go to this school for film. I basically decide, do I go to Philly, do a writing program, or do I go to the school Webster University in St. Louis for a filmmaking program? And there I could maybe play soccer because I played soccer in high school. I really loved it. And uh, I opted for Philly because I was like, oh, it's close to New York. And if I want to transfer, I'll, I'll just do that. It was it was a first year program. They had just created the writing program, so I kind of had free reign. But I still wanted out of there. I still wanted to go to to, to New York. I was like Philly just felt like a, a stopping point. And after a couple of years, I applied to to NYU, and I found out that uh, I was misinformed, and none of my credits transferred. So I would have had to restart at NYU and go into some serious debt for undergrad. So I just stuck it out in Philly. Then it seems like you found somewhat of a creative community for yourself in Philly. Yeah, you know, after the fact, I made a, a pact with myself. I, I, I started co-writing with one of my professors from from art school, and I was and, and I told myself, oh, I'll spend two years working a job that I hate, and then I'll move out to California with a handful of scripts, and then I'll just get into something there. And in the interim is when I started playing music as sort of an outlet or a hobby to kind of mix things up with working on screenplays and working in a coffee shop. You did execute that plan? You stayed for two years and then moved to LA? Oh, I wish I had. No. <laughs> what happened was when I when I finished school, I got an apartment, a fourth floor walk up across the street from a Starbucks that I just got a job at. So that every day that I was writing, I could look out the window and see the job that I didn't want to go to. And I was going to motivate me. And uh, it drove me crazy, actually. Yeah, where did that mindset come from? Um, it seemed pretty dramatic. <laughs> do you still do things like that to yourself? Uh, maybe to a lesser extent. You know, it's it's one of those things where, um, I mean, the whole reason I started playing music is I bought a keyboard. You know, and that, that's kind of what happened. out of school for about a year and then a buddy of mine told me that there was this piano warehouse going out of business and had been there since you know the 19th century and they're going to turn this building into new york style lofts and they were trashing all these pianos and he, he was calling me because he was like look th there's a world that's certain here for 400 dollars, and that's mine but there's a Rhodes keyboard here for 400 dollars. wow if you want it you should get it it's cool and i was like i had no idea what, what that meant but i was like oh that's cool man and um and I, I spent, you know, I, I crammed it into a cab somehow. And $400 at that time was was a month's rent. And I brought it home and I didn't really, I didn't know the names of cores. I didn't know what I was doing. But my senior year of, of college, um, there was a grad stu a student who I was friends with. And her fiance, and I think husband and father of their children now, was, was this guy, Jeff Mueller. Do you know Jeff? No. He was in uh, Shipping News, June of 44. Right, I know like, those bands, but I, I don't know Jeff personally. Yeah, and I, and you know, and and I met him, and I, you know, I was like a twenty-one-year-old college senior at art school, and I just said, "Hey, 
what what should I be listening to? And uh, he made me go out and buy uh, Delay by Can and like a Black Heart Procession record. Yeah, I'm telling you, you should have just been hanging with the cool kids when you were in Germany. You could have. I know, I know, but then, <laughs> but but once I once I heard Can, it just it blew my mind. It just kind of like opened the doors, and 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 then learning that that was a keyboard based band, and uh, yeah. So that's why I bought a keyboard. Well, that's interesting because I always think of it as a drum-based band. Oh yeah, it's a well, killer drummer. R.I.P. R.I.P. Yaki. Yeah, what an incredible drummer. So when did you end up moving to L.A.? Twenty thirteen. Oh, so it was a it was like a considerably longer than two years before you moved out here. Oh yeah, it was one of those things where you know. I started the band as kind of a fluke. Like, I wonder if I can make one record. It might be weird and shitty, but... And then I'll just move to L.A., and that would have been it. That would have been the period of my life in which I tried to start a band. And then it kind of of took over my life, and Philly became a place that was really inexpensive to operate out of. And so, you know, I, I would still juggle all these day jobs for, like, the first six years of the band, and then after a while, I was I just had to quit them all because we were touring so much. And then after a while, I wasn't living anywhere. My stuff was just in storage for about six years, actually. You said the band took over your life. But I mean, is there a point when that became your intention to devote yourself more to the band than screenwriting? Oh, it was definitely between the first and second record. And uh, I joke about how, you know, my entire lineup between the first and second record, like, quit. And so... <laughs> In, in hindsight, you know, I can look back and be like, oh, my career is basically uh, my, my spite shop against Mocha Joe, you know? <laughs> you mean it's so it's... <laughs> so like, it's, I'll show you guys. You guys didn't believe in this band. I'll show you. Is it that they didn't believe in the band or maybe you... I think I was, I think I was a pain in the ass. And it was also, you know, we did one national tour and then everyone quit. I'm sure I wasn't, you know, I was a crazy early 20-something and everyone else was too, so... I mean, I, I don't, I don't fault anyone for not wanting to play with me. I get it. But then, once that option went away, you realized how badly you wanted to proceed. Yeah, I think it's because I just sacrificed a couple of years of my life pursuing this thing. And you know, when we our first label, you know, we signed to them for two records, so I at least wanted to do another record. Did you get a different kind of visceral feeling from playing music once you started? messing around with that roads than you had in your other storytelling avenues? Oh, absolutely. Cause the thing about the roads is it's just, it's a physical thing that you really like lean into and work. And, um, and, and, and I found that even though I didn't know what I was doing, if I made these shapes with my hands, I, I it was easier for me to sing and come up with melodies and ideas uh, that I couldn't find on a guitar. Because the music that I was making on guitar, I was never happy with it. But with a keyboard, it, and, and, and my keyboard playing, actually, I think you'll appreciate this, uh, is completely informed by playing with drummers. Like, I'm a rhythmic player. And that's, and that's because I've been lucky enough to play with completely incredible drummers. When you go back and listen to your first album, how do you feel? Uh, I'm like, wow. That is a weird trip. Uh, the first record, you know, there, there's a lot of emotions because the first record, I, you know, it, it, it was kind of an accidental career in a lot of ways. You know, I, I, I wasn't intending to be the singer. We were going to get a, uh, a female singer. We never found one. So then I got stuck being the singer. And so I didn't think I was going to make more than one record. So I just tried to scream everything and shred my vocals and destroy my voice. And I kind of did. And, and, it was made for five hundred dollars, and I like I remember all of that. Like we had money to record two nights only after hours in a studio, me and the drummer, the original drummer Tom, and I had never worked with a click. It was just a lot of learning experience. I had no idea what I was doing. As long as I don't do mushrooms and listen to my records, I can appreciate them. <laughs> what happens <laughs> when I you do mushrooms? I get a little too like, oh my god, how does anyone live or think like this? <laughs> gets a little too heady for me but uh i'm actually i'm re- really proud of all the albums especially that first one it it sounds so raw 
I mean, the, the thing that gets me, though, is people that still want me to make that first record over and over again. I just have zero desire to do that. Well, yeah, you mentioned that it was sort of an accidental career. Yeah. So people, people's response exceeded what you could have ever imagined? It was just a weird thing. Like, we never, we didn't shop our, you know, we made a little demo uh, in this art space, 1026, which I think is now defunct in Philly. And, and we made, recorded four songs, and a buddy of mine played in this hardcore band, An Albatross. I remember on, that band. Yeah, and they were, my, my friend was friends with the drummer Jeremy. And without asking, he kicked our four song demo CDR over to Ace Foo. And next thing we knew, we had like an offer to do two records. For 500 bucks each? <laughs> 500, and then like I think the second one was 1,000. Mm -hmm. So what a deal. Someone owns my master's. For fifteen hundred dollars for the rest of my life. Oh man! And they yeah, they own the masters for that. They own the masters for those first two records for the rest of my life. Wow! Fifteen hundred dollars. What a deal! Not necessarily. You can negotiate to get them back. I can, but it, but ironically, because it was so low, those are the records that I made money on just because the recoup was immediate. Well, let's talk about your new record. Dream Hunting in the Valley of the In-Between, which is not on Ace Foo. It's on Sub Pop. Yes. And um, some of your collaborators are friends of mine. Oh, yeah. Because totally. I play... Cyrus. Cyrus, yeah. And, and I play with Cyrus in John Daly's band. Oh, I've, I have seen you've him multiple played, times. You've played in John Daly's band before, too. Or you've oh, yeah. collaborated he's come with John. On, he's, he's come on tour with us. Um. But tell me about how you made this new record. I mean, there were seven years between the last one and this one. Um, yeah. What was the process for making this, and what was the impetus <laughs> for making it after so long? You know, I, in my brain, it was five years, just because, you know, when you put out a record, typically you tour behind it for a year or two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our last record was 2013. We toured through 2015, and then things kind of imploded, and... uh without going into too much detail, I was kind of put in a situation where it was, it was an, a force into hiatus of sorts and which, which is truly maddening, but was also uh, fortuitous in a way because, because of that, I met Cyrus and uh, I met Cyrus because we we're doing John Daly's podcast in 2013. And I met Cyrus and Brett then both guys who ended up playing with me. And uh, you know, I, I recorded a kid's record with Cyrus. That was the first thing we did together. And then he produced my solo record. And then from the solo band, I was able to meet a lot of the players that ended up being in Man Man down the road. And uh, th this record, it takes me a long time to write songs because I have this, I just have this affliction where uh, I forget how to write songs after every record's done. I mean, I think that's a relatively common phenomenon. Yeah, it sucks, man. <laughs> And uh, and I've I haven't been able to change it. And I've tried, and and I'm 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 a perspiration over inspiration kind of person. So I really just have to put in the time in order to get songs to come out of me. Well, another thing to remember is that um, what you call forgetting to how to write songs is part of your process. It's just like you could think of it as the incubation period. Yeah, that, that, that's what I tell myself, that I'm just I'm out in the world absorbing information that w may manifest itself into a song someday. Right. Uh, as I'm watching The Walking Dead season nine or something. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know. What you said before was a little bit mysterious, and I don't want to get too personal if you don't want to get into it, but what, what do you mean when you say that you were forced into a hiatus? Well, I just... Uh, I had, a, I had a bandmate who was like starting a family and he needed time off and that was totally fine. But then the years just, it turned into years. And so it, it's all sorted out. And I, I wish, I wish everyone who played with me the best of luck in their lives. Um, but I just couldn't use the name for a while, which was, it was, it was kind of discombobulating because, you know, it, it was the band that I started and suddenly I didn't, I couldn't use my own name. Do you feel like the um, identity of the band is separate from you as a person? Um, I think that's the thing I struggle with the most because I had to suddenly make a solo record and I had always viewed this band as my solo record, you know? Um, you know, supported by incredible musicians always, but I, 
you know, I kind of poured everything into this project. So to suddenly have to like call it something else. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really confusing. It was very hard, but, uh, you know, but like I said, I had, I had Cyrus, I had my friend Rollin who was very supportive and knew that I was kind of struggling with, uh, with, with keeping on. And that, that's like where the, uh, the album title comes from. And, you know, it's, it's, it's straddling that place of, um, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to use the name man, man again. And, and I didn't know if my still trying to pursue this thing of mine was delusional. Should I just try to move on? Should I close this chapter of my life and do something different? Or should I just persevere? It was purgatory in a lot of ways. Was there any debate as to whether to release the album amidst a global pandemic? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Sub Pop, they definitely gave me the option. You know, when we started to see the writing on the wall, they said, you know, you can push this till later in the year. And uh, I opted against it because I, I feel like people need music right now more than ever. They need distractions. They need they need something to soundtrack uh, what they're going through. And putting out later in the year, no one can still you know. There's no touring to support an album right now. And then the one thing that I didn't factor in when we decided to stay the course was how it would affect promoting a record because there's there's pr is hard to come by you can only work so hard when outlets that are normally there have to let go of all their staff and aren't hiring freelancers so it's a real trickle down effect i mean it's something that i've been thinking about a a lot because i have a record coming out it was supposed to come out on the 15th of this month but it's been pushed back and part of the calculus for that is that um, as a quote unquote solo artist, this is my first record. So I don't have, I have to like build an audience from yeah. the ground up. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough, man. Um, but people have been super supportive and, you know, you have to try to find alternate ways to deal with it. And the feedback has been great. I, my only fear of putting out a record right now is, that it just slips through the cracks because there's just more pressing issues going on in the world. Right. But then if you delay too long, it'll slip through the cracks potentially because there's an yeah. avalanche of delayed records coming out all at once. Yeah. That was my thought too, was that if we push it back to the fall, so is everyone else. So then you're just going to just get this wave of music and I, the silver lining in it is this is a long, this is a long player. It's a double LP at 17 songs. And people have time to listen to that right now. Have you been hearing back from people that have been doing just that, listening with intent? Yeah, and it, it's it's been uh, overwhelmingly positive, and it's great to hear that it's connecting with people. You know, because it was an album that was born out of, um, you know, uncertainty, but it also is an album that is very joyous and fun, and it zigs when you think it's going to zag. And it's, you know, it's, it's much about... Uh, coping with something as it is moving on and finding the positives of, 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 of a situation. And so I think people are really connecting with that. And it's funny, actually, uh, funny in quotes again. Um, I never thought that my joking about making apocalyptic pop would come to fruition. You know, <laughs> uh, our, our first our first music video for this thing came out a week before people had a shelter in place. And it's a video of an old man dancing by himself on empty city streets. Man, if you would have just waited a few weeks to shoot that, it would have been a lot easier. No permits necessary. Oh, I just got Shutterstock footage. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Did you have a tour booked? Oh, yeah. And has it been rebooked? Uh, I mean, w- my booking agent's doing is due diligence and we we have holds right now, but it's not going to happen. You know, we had two tours booked out and we were working on a European tour when it became clear that there's not there's not going to be any touring this year. I don't see how there would be. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my tour got rescheduled for October, um, the yeah. end of October. We're hoping that it will still be possible to do, but. Um, if it doesn't, you know, no big deal. I'll just tour when I have a second record, I guess. 
Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, I've I've heard that realistically, twenty twenty one, like middle twenty twenty one, and I, I was talking to Dan from Wolfbreed the other day, and he was hearing that twenty twenty two is when is when people think it's really going to be okay to tour again, which is crushing to me <laughs> because we make our livelihood on the road. So, do you have a backup plan for the intervening time? Um. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a lot right now, not music, but just, uh, like script stuff. Yeah. I was going to say now would be a great time to sell a script. Yeah. I've been working on a, on a, on a TV show, um, we, we, with a, with with a buddy of mine and we're breaking the second and third episodes and hopefully we'll emerge from this pandemic with three episodes, three full scripts. I wrote the pilot already, three full scripts and then a season outline. Well, it's going to be just like you envisioned when you were gazing across at the Starbucks at your original writing room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that scenario is, is, is the uh, global pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Honus, Honus, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Joe. Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Trap Set.